Thank you very much, Rob, for coming on today. Okay. Um, so how I want to start this was basically say, like, I think that, like, when I started, like, thinking of the people that I wanted for the podcast, yours was, was one of the first names that came up. Like, um, to me, like, you're sort of like a mini sort of a hero to me. Like, it sounds... <laughs> Um, but like yeah like what you've done in your life and where you are with your business and all that is quite interesting but I think people quite probably know of what you do but not necessarily know who you are as a person okay. so um, yeah I think like maybe explain sort of I mean I mean, there's a huge long list of what you've done and what you've achieved in <laughs> your life and uh, I think it's quite incredible where you've got to so sort of yeah like if you explain about like active hands, that's probably the best place to start. So people okay, get do you want to start with active hands or start with my injury or what? Just go go with active hands first, and then we okay. yeah go from there. Okay. Um, well, active hands started um, just out of need for my own um, frustration from when I couldn't um, use stuff in the gym. So um, I had my injury over twenty years ago, um, and I wanted to be able to train in the gym and use the gym equipment. Like I was quite a um, an active gym user before my injury and played a lot of sport uh, and then when I was in hospital I was just found it so frustrating that I couldn't use I couldn't grip all the gym equipment so I couldn't therefore you know work train my upper body and um, try and get back to some sort of fitness that I wanted to for pushing my chair around yeah. and for day-to-day -day use so um, it initially just started once I'd left hospital um, I spoke to my mum and we tried to work out a way that we could manufacture some sort of gripping thing uh, and the, the first initial prototype was literally a ski glove with um, long pieces of velcro stuck to each finger and then bits yeah. of velcro randomly put around the hand so you could sort of get each finger and push it down onto the velcro but um, it was all right for picking up very small things but it was pretty rubbish and the velcro <laughs> got stuck everywhere and you couldn't yeah. lift anything heavy um, and over time we just developed you know for a few different products until we came up with a sort of general purpose gripping aid, which is very similar to what we still sell today. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, it's a really great product that you do. Um, like, for me personally, having, like, I wouldn't be able to do half what I'm doing with the gym or with adaptive form without the gripping aid. Yeah. So for me, it's like a big, huge difference in my life. And I know it is to a lot of other people mm -hmm. as well. So yeah, what you're doing there is like really, really awesome. Right? Yeah, and that's a nice feeling as well, because we do, um, we do get loads of lovely messages back from our customers, you know, saying um, how much it's changed their lives, how much it's improved their lives. And uh, it started off very much within a spine injury realm, you know, because that's my knowledge base. Um, but now, you know, we had a lovely message uh, about a year or so ago from a guy in America who used to uh, do, he was like a high level BMX racer. Uh, and he had some sort of injury which affected his um, grip on one hand. Uh, and for 30 years he didn't BMX race hmm. and then he met up with a friend who was doing like the veteran scene of sort of BMX racing yeah. uh, and he said you know why have you stopped you must be able to find some sort of adaption which will help you grip and he went searching around the internet and found us um, bought one of our products the general purpose and now he's racing and back and winning kind of veteran level BMX oh, nice. stuff again that's so and, good yeah. you know it's nice it went when you see how much it's changed his life, you know, how much it's given him back. Yeah, and he's, yeah. He's like, you know, flowing with compliments and stuff about how they are. And it's lovely to get those messages and to know that stuff that we're making is making a real difference to people's lives, you know. Yeah, all, it definitely does. Like, I have a lot of contacts, obviously, through what I'm doing with Instagram and that. And I've, you know, travelled a bit and I've seen your products where, wherever mm, I go when I meet yeah. quads and that. And if somebody hasn't, then they're like, I'm direct, straight to you. So yeah, it's like, thank you. Go and, have a, go and have a look it's just like that yeah. make a huge difference um, yeah like say it's it's quite a, a simple idea but it makes a huge difference which is like where some of the best things come mm. from a simple idea and a passion and then it yeah. blossoms into something that actually makes a big difference in yeah life. and it is it is a very simple product you know when we sort of describe it to people without seeing it sometimes they think it's some sort of big mechanical thing and yeah. you know electronics to make it work and all the rest of it but you know it's just such a simple way that we've made it work yeah but there's little bits about it like the way that the hands curved there's no seams on the inside and we sort of sew the all the loops and buckles very tightly so that when you're trying to thread one through the other when your hands don't work they all stay stiff so they're not wobbling about everywhere and little touches like that you know being able to pull it with a ring rather than needing a finger pinch yeah. it to pull it tight 
um, it does make all the difference between you know being a, a product you're happy to use every day in the gym and one that you just think that's oh, just a bit too much hassle I won't bother yeah that's like probably the like the best bit about it is that it's so well designed like I say it's a simple product but mm -hmm. there's so many little things in there that makes it yeah like really easy to use um, like they always say like good design is when you don't notice the design and yeah, that's exactly what yeah. the product like you don't notice all these little things it just yeah, works it's, nice. it's just like that's yeah. what's so great about it and yeah, yeah it's really cool like, and obviously from the gripping age you moved on and did some other products as well now and yeah so just... it started with the general purpose one um, and then over time we developed new products just mostly from my own um, use of them in the gym you know we've developed products so that if you uh, want to use two hands you know particularly for, for quads um, if you want to use two hands for doing some sort of pulling exercise once you've got a general purpose attached you can't then attach the second hand so that's where like the looped aids come from and the d-rings and then more recently the new hook aids as well um, and then there's other little sort of additional products that go along and then the most recent one I suppose is the small items aid yeah which is for holding sort of pens and pencils and um, that was actually in response to a couple of people. One a guy saying he wanted to hold um, drumsticks, okay, uh, and then someone else saying that they wanted to hold makeup items so that they could do their own personal care. Okay, you yeah, know, yeah. That, that sort of ability to do those small, really personal things that maybe you'd have to use a PA to do otherwise. Um, yeah, but you know something like putting your makeup on or shaving or cleaning your teeth or you know those little things just gives you your independence back. Um, and it's quite a valuable thing to be able to do. I think it affects people more than maybe some people outside of what we go through understand. Just to be able to do those little jobs yourself, you know, put makeup on, for example. Yeah, yeah, of um, course. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like, it's nice to see it like expand out of like obviously the gripping aids. They do help as a general one, and then the other mm. ones sort of more gym specific. But having another one that's a little bit more broad because yeah, again, not everybody's into the gym and not yeah. everybody's into that. And yeah. having something that you can help those people with. That's really cool. Like when I saw it, I was like, "Oh, that's great!" Like um, I learned how to do because I like doing some art on that, and I sort yeah. of learned how to do it with my fingers. But yeah. something like that would be, yeah, like help, like would have helped me in the beginning if I wasn't doing that and doing yeah. that sort of thing. And I think also as Active Hands has, in, has grown, you know, like okay, so we, we we started off very much catering for a spinal cord injury market um, mm. for quads, but um, as that has you know, if we've advertised more and people have learnt more about us, then we've realised that a lot of our customers now are people who've had stroke, um, people with sort of nerve injuries and brain injuries and CP and MS, and there's a whole vast range of people who have hand functions are affected, even lots of small, strange disabilities that we've never heard of before, yeah. um, even that we keep finding out about. Um, so it's not just for quads, so that, you know, some of these other products are more relevant to some of our other markets really um, even though you know they very much can be used by quads as well yeah that's good and um, you were saying earlier like how it's like the business has grown which is something I just want to talk about like you know I said at the beginning you, you've got a whole list of things you've done you're an inventor you're a business owner entrepreneur but you know you're also an athlete and a dad and all that while being a quadriplegic which is amazing so I want to talk about more like you know, how it was being like a business but setting up as a disabled person is not always this you know you've got all these other things going on in your life being mm. a quadriplegic and then you decided I'm going to start a business that's a great yeah. idea sort of thing and it's just like uh, that's for me personally as someone who's trying to do that themselves it's like really fascinating to see and to learn from and that so yeah like how was you know what was that like set, you know coming across businesses and that um, I think I've always been the sort of person who likes to run my own business. I mean, uh, before my injury, when I was 11, 12 years old, I used to run a little craft business and I used to make cards and things and um, jewelry and sell them to craft like um, shops around near me and do little craft sales and things. And I've always been quite entrepreneurial. Um, and I think it, it sits much nicer with me to be able to be responsible for everything I do. So, you know, I don't have to answer to a boss I don't kind of, uh, I don't know. I just get the, I get a kick out of being able to set something up from scratch and see where it can go to. Yeah, I'm quite a, a long term person, you know. I don't flip between things quickly. So um, setting up a business comes quite 
naturally. Um, it's difficult with a person, you know, when you've got a, another a condition as well, like having a disability. Um, and we were we were talking a bit last night, weren't we, about how benefits can be a bit of a, a faff when you're trying to set up a business and yeah. how you are and you, there's low regulations about what you can and can't earn. And to be honest, some of that stuff is more of a hassle than actually setting up the business yeah, and getting going and, and all the rest of it. Um, but yeah, like I've always enjoyed. Yeah, always been in that to, mindset and yeah. wanting to like, yeah, like be on, do your own path rather than yeah. Just... So um, before Active Hands, I had a, another business where I was running club nights and an events business, and um, that was really good fun. I ran that for uh, about five or six or seven years, and I was running club nights all over my local area in, in Leamington and Coventry, Birmingham, London. Um, and it was still fairly small, but it was quite good fun. And we ended up doing a couple of really big events. Um, and then that was before the financial crisis hit and then people weren't really spending money on, yeah. on events and, and uh, entertainment. Um, but it's always been nice to just be able to do things on my terms. Yeah. Uh, um, and I might not always get it right, but they're my mistakes and I learn from those mistakes. Yeah. So um, I quite like things that way. Yeah, that's good. Um, so... With the when you talk about the event stuff as well, I was quite interested like how that works, like getting around in your wheelchair. Because obviously, you might go to a field and like you yeah. to do an event, and it's just like, well, well yeah. I'm not getting around this field very easily today. Like, what was that like? Did you have um, to plan around that sort of thing? It's quite hard work. I mean, I um, I am incomplete, so I can take a f like very short distances. I can use crutches, um, mm. and I. I don't really, I can't do it so much anymore, but when, you know, in my earlier days, it was a bit easier to, to walk, you know, 100 metres on crutches, but now it's, it's not something I can, I can do so much. But um, it, it was a real hard effort in a lot of places because, you know, a lot of clubs, for example, were inaccessible or yeah. not easily accessible. Uh, and then you've got like busy dance floors in the dark, and wet floors yeah. and all the rest of it. So um, it was hard work and also, it was a bit weird because I used to do flyering after events and if someone comes up to you in a wheelchair and gives you a flyer, they're not expecting it to be for a club night. No. They're expecting it to be for some sort of like charity or something. Yeah. Like, <laughs> people always gave me a bit of a weird look. Um, so there was this experiences of, you know, coming to terms with that and, you know, when you meet a client for the first time, they're sort of like, well, this guy's in a wheelchair. <laughs> but, you know, should I mention that or should it, will it affect what house he's going to perform yeah. you know, as what we've hired him to do sort of thing so that was interesting to to overcome um and it was a good fun time doing the event stuff you know i worked with some interesting people and had some good events that were really good fun but um i now really enjoy doing the doing active hands it's just it feels like it's contributing more to the world yeah and it's definitely. more um specific to me really you know with training as well and athletic doing that um and the kind of power athlete and working in that field, producing stuff that's going to help those people as well. Yeah. Um, talk about like when people, you see people and uh, they go on at like, say like, oh, what's this person doing like, in the wheelchair, give me a club night sort of thing. Like, do you feel, because you say you've been injured, what, 20 years now? Yeah, 21, I think. Yeah, 22. do you feel like there's been like a, that's quite like, obviously quite a long time. Do you think there's like been a perception shift in disability or is it, do you reckon more like your personal self? I don't know, I think... There has certainly been a shift in the in the UK. You know, I think twenty twelve was a massive influencer yeah. on how people view disability, disability sports, and dis people with disabilities in the media. Mm. Um, uh, you know, things like the last leg have had a big influence on that, um, and you know how well the Paralympics went and stuff. Uh, I think also you you set the tone by your own sort of actions and how you come across to people as well. So yeah. if you meet someone for the first time and you get on with talking about you know your, the business that you're running or what you're doing or what you can provide for them they might still be a little bit um unsure at the start but when you carry it through and you can show you know you talk about the other stuff and you get on with it then people will sort of realize that you're serious in that way and that, yeah uh to think you know not be so concerned about the, the disability side of it yeah i think that's like a key thing to be is like how you present yourself to the world if you're there like shy and in yourself mm, and then they, yeah. think, like, they just see the disability but if you're 
more outgoing and show mm. who you are, really are as a person that's who they see more yeah is, I think so yeah it, it helps obviously that you are quite an outgoing person yeah that, like say the first time I met you I don't know it was at the Stoke Mandeville Games and it like you're just everywhere I think <laughs> like everybody says oh yeah I know Robbie's everywhere sort of yeah. thing so within like the spinal unit everybody know like spinal yeah. like, like area everybody knows you because you're always yeah. at these events yeah I mean I used to do a lot more of that because I used to be involved in helping out with the was I helping with the rugby or the racing uh the racing yeah yeah and then you were like oh these active hands as well. <laughs> yeah that's how I found out about them actually. yeah yeah so I used to do a lot more of that stuff it's, it's a bit difficult time wise now I've got a family I can't really yeah. go away and do all these things so much now but um it yeah I did used to really enjoy that sort of thing and getting out there and I, I remember from when I was in hospital myself the things that influenced me most were when you see someone who's had an injury come back into a spinal unit maybe to have a little procedure done or something you know and they're there for a few days and you're sort of you know grilling them for you know what's life like on the outside yeah, it's like yeah. you're a prisoner in some ways isn't it yeah that's a like a feature for you to say I got quite a lot of you know I got more information from those people than I've ever got from any doctors or nurses yeah. or physios and that because they know what it's like yeah living on the outside as uh, you yeah. call it yeah and <laughs> it is different you know if you're someone who's sitting in hospital now listen to this you know it, it is a daunting environment to go out into and the spinal unit or wherever you are is set up for you the floors are flat there's no big curbs and it's cold it's, so it's warm you know yeah everything's set up you've got accessible showers and all it's, rest of it's it. like the uh, spinal equivalent of a padded room yeah <laughs> yeah and it's not like that in, uh, out in the real world no um but there's, there's ways you can overcome things and there's ways you manage the things you can't overcome uh, and that takes a while to to get used to that but um it's quite you know there's always a transition period of sort of getting used to what's happened to you and yeah definitely with it in your head yeah because you don't really know what's you know you know what's happening in hospital you don't know what's happening out there so whenever i'm back at the spine i always try and talk to a few people if i see yeah. them around say hello you know yeah me too you know like ask them about what's you know what's happening in their day and all that sort of mm. thing i think it's really important to sort of be there for those people and there are some great schemes out there like backup do yeah, mentoring yeah, we've, schemes and we've talked a lot about backup I mean I they are a great charity and both yeah. of us were involved very much at the start and yes yeah, um, they um they do some really fantastic work and uh yeah like their their mentoring scheme is said uh, my friend Sam's just started being a mentor for them and I know some other people that have done it in the yeah. past and you know they go into the spinal units as well and go and talk to people or you know, we'll phone you up and ask how it's going and mm. all this sort of thing. And, mm. you know, for some people, they might not need that, but there's quite a few people that do need it. And that's, yeah, yeah it's really cool that there's something out there. Yeah. For and it. I, I did feel very encouraged by them in the first couple of years of, of um, coming out of hospital. And I did loads of the stuff. And, you know, a lot of those courses do generate your confidence of being outside and sort of, they push your limits and show what you can do. And, like you say, there's loads of people that we've spoken to and that we know, as well as ourselves, who have had a real change in attitude after going on yeah, a course like that or something similar. There are other courses. Yeah, because they do a couple. Of, they do like uh, like the wheelchair skills one, which is mm. quite good for like learning how to mm. use your wheelchair out and about in yeah. the worst conditions that yeah. you might have. There's adventure holidays, skiing holidays, and all that, and just seeing mm. like here's what you can do, and it's yeah. like. Yeah, because you don't really know what you can do until you sort of push yourself, and that's yeah, what they sort of basically yeah. do. They push you. Yeah, and it's good for learning as well. I did the, um, I became a wheelchair skills trainer. So you go on a course and they teach you how to do it all, you know, as, as well as you can, and then you learn how to teach other people as well. And mm. that's been that was a really good, yeah, that's it, you know, way of learning and then passing that on. Yeah, it's. I feel like I don't know specifically what it's like with other sort of injuries or disabilities or whatever but the spinal in, like this spinal sort of community as such is i feel it's quite a good one like yeah we seem to all want to help each other out I mean, yeah. obviously there's some people that don't but they're like the majority of people i think because of the type of people that spinal injury type generally affects that generally because they've had an accident where they've been very outgoing and they've done yeah. something a little yeah. bit silly and they've had an accident mm. so because of that it's all outgoing people that are all yeah, I mean the, the, the predominant sort of demographic of spinal cord injury is kind of young males isn't it yeah. basically um, and it's not necessarily the case that completely but um, I think that gives it a bit of a, a sort of a club as well and yeah. also 
I think the spiny ants, because you're in there for so long, uh, they do generate a bit of a, a kind of atmosphere of yeah, um, definitely being together as a unit and yeah, and then, camaraderie and that. Yeah. yeah, you're in the same room, you're in the same situation. Yeah. Together. it's probably a bit like if you were, you know, in a like a military compound yeah. together yeah, and you're yeah. all doing the same thing and you're all going for this yeah. tough time together and it's sort of like yeah. you sort of bond and become you know you you learn about each other and everything you yeah. know and you are thrown together with some real randoms in there as well oh yeah definitely <laughs> um people yeah it's the only thing in common you've got is a spinal cord injury but yeah from all over the, the you know people you wouldn't come across in normal like daily life it's yeah exactly yeah that. it's a very big mix because it doesn't yeah. it doesn't choose people does no. <laughs> no. yeah, it it's not uh specific to one type of person yeah but yeah it's um so you're saying earlier about like you, you know you've got your family in that now um that's something that you know going forward is like there's i don't feel there's like a lot of information out there about like the family sort of side of it mm-hmm. when somebody sees somebody in a wheelchair normally they just assume that they're a single person that yeah. doesn't have any life out, you know relationship yeah. life and that so yeah um, especially someone who's young they, and they've just had their injury they might be like oh why would anybody want to be with me sort yeah. of thing so I feel like yeah talk about that sort of stuff would be really helpful to people okay um, well after I had my injury I I didn't find it too hard um, going back into the world and sort of I don't know, being confident about, you know, meeting girls and stuff like that, I, um, within a few years, I, I felt fairly confident in my wheelchair, and in fact, you know, I used my crutches quite a lot to begin with when I went left hospital, and I actually found that um, it's a bit more disabling actually being on crutches sometimes, and I think a lot of people uh, don't really understand, they don't get it, people who are able-bodied see a wheelchair as very much being... Um, something you want to get out of you know yeah. and, and if there, there's a possibility that you could walk a f- few steps with crutches that that would be the preferred option uh, and that's what my mindset was for even for quite a few years after um, leaving hospital and it takes a while to realize that actually you're more certainly for my level of ability of walking um, you're much more disabled on your crutches than you are in a wheelchair because you, yeah you can't go fast you can't carry things you can't like be spontaneous you can't go go around and there are restrictions on wheelchairs obviously you know the yeah. terrain that you're going on but in general um it's a lot easier and a lot more sociable and easy to be around people yeah. in a chair um so i've sort of found that after i sort of realized that i didn't feel i don't know i think you you're a similar person after your injury as you are before and it does yeah. affect you but once you sort of get your head around what's happened you become a similar person to who you were before yeah. the injury um, so I didn't really have any major embarrassment or or like kind of I didn't feel restricted at talking to girls and meeting girls and stuff like yeah. that um, yeah I was interested in what you were saying about like the wheelchair and that I always try and say to people it, I'm not like bound to the wheelchair the wheelchair enables me to do yeah. things yeah. like it's a great thing that I have a wheelchair because yeah. if I didn't have one mm. I wouldn't be able to do a half well I wouldn't be able to do anything but I'd yeah. be stuck in bed all day so yes, which is exactly what they used to do with spinal injury people yeah. initially they just stuck them in a bed and left them wait till to die basically yeah exactly so a wheelchair is actually an amazing thing that yeah. allows you know so many possibilities and that. yeah so very much so it's, it's quite good to get that point across to people and like yeah. you know once they know once they understand that that's quite good especially yeah. if you've got like a group of friends and they understand that and then if you're going out with them and doing yeah. things they can sort of not like protect you or anything but like they can be there to be you know yeah people need to understand that we do have limitations yeah but that we still want to take part in as much of the stuff as we can yeah um, and I think that's yeah it's just about people that you know being able to help you overcome those limitations but not sort of modicum you there so that you you can't you're not being involved with stuff yeah they sort of like push you to be the better, like mm-hmm. a better person which yeah. is like the sort of friends you want exactly yeah. around you yeah. especially in those early days yeah yeah but yeah like you said we was talking about like the relationship side mm-hmm. of it yeah, yeah like, again for myself um I never found there was like an issue talking to girls or that and never really had an issue with them talking to me back either yeah. um you get some that are 
you know a drunk girl that's you know yeah. a bit too drunk and she wants to sit on your lap and yeah. that and it's a bit like I don't yeah. really want this right now but take it or leave it depending, yeah. What's yeah, depending on the situation you're young, free and single and uh, <laughs> yeah. you've got a hot girl wanting to sit on your lap you know you just decide whether you like yeah I'll go for that <laughs> Yeah, exactly. that's not what you want but um yeah it's it's quite um obviously it's a bit different you know i found that i had a lot more girls approaching me rather than me yeah. having to approach girls yeah so um but i always say that it's a really good sort of filter for people the wheelchair like Very much i agree. wouldn't want to date somebody that wouldn't want to date someone because they're in a wheelchair anyway mm -hmm. so being in a wheelchair means that yeah you, you actually those people already those people are already gone all yeah. the you know pretentious yeah. and you know shallow people they're sort of yeah you know they all they're already filtered out and yeah. generally I feel like because you, you met um, Joe your wife after your injury yes and it seems that like there are some people that get injured and they have relationships that fail and that mm. seems to be more common than yeah. somebody who finds someone after their injury and yeah. that seems to be you know it's different in every circumstance yeah. but yeah like yeah what was like how did you meet Joe and how was that how did that all come apart well um I've lived in some quite interesting houses. I've been always involved in like doing big house parties and things and um, the sort of social scene and stuff. So um, after I graduated um, from my engineering degree, I stayed around in the area where my university is. Um, so I kind of ended up living in houses uh, with lots of other graduates. Um, and after a, a few years, I ended up living in a house of 13 people. So massive it used to be an old people's home uh but it was sort of turned into student accommodation or graduate accommodation uh, and there was 13 bedrooms and 13 people uh, and we used to have absolutely massive house parties and like <laughs> hundreds of people in our house particularly when i was running a club night and yeah. people knew about that um so we have some huge parties uh and i think i've been living in that house for two years and then uh somebody moved out across the corridor from me and joe moved in um and within about six months we had sort of started seeing each other oh, that's nice, so, nice but it was easy just you know i just used to work, talk to her when she came home from work and um just got to know her that way and then um yeah we got closer and closer and uh yeah it's been us for i should know this we got married in 2010 <laughs> so uh she can eight, skip this bit so. yeah yeah <laughs> so eight and a half years have been married and been seeing each other for a few years before that that's lovely yeah it's it's good to that that you know like another say she met you in another way i don't know how it would have worked but the fact she got to know you as a person and that and i just didn't see the wheelchair and yeah all that stuff. yeah that's no we just I, I think that's the way that relationships happen best if you sort of get to know people as a friend and then yeah exactly and that's more. that's just the same as that doesn't matter if you're in a wheelchair or not yeah, so yeah. it's you know like that the wheelchair doesn't really affect the situation at all yeah. which is quite important for people i think to they find out on themselves but knowing mm. that the wheelchair isn't the be all and end all of everything that controls their life you know yeah, it's just the same so. yeah. yeah there's not really much difference yeah and i mean there will be people who it becomes an issue for um i remember when joe told me that her she's a, a primary school teacher or she was um her headmistress came took her aside and said you know are you sure you want to be dating this guy in a wheelchair he's gonna really limit your you know prospects for the future and stuff like that and she was really offended by it and yeah that, you know, i imagine this she was to be honest a rubbish head teacher right? yes yeah, that's uh, not a good person she was very it. negative on disability in general um which was a bit of a frustration but um you know there will always be people people out there who see an issue with it yeah um, i think generally those people that see the issue it's not because it's more about the ignorance of it like they yeah. don't understand the situation they don't understand you they don't understand yeah. what you can do they just see a wheelchair and they're like oh yeah and especially somebody from an older generation yeah. because yeah. when they grew up they didn't see disabled people around because no, they no, were stuck in an old person's so. home or something so yeah, yeah. so you see it like you say that like after 2012 like the perceptions changed because of the paralympics and uh, and in this you say in this country um the, that sort of shift towards seeing like oh these people aren't just in a wheelchair they're doing things like mm. they're bit they're people and they have lives and yeah and i think the visibility on um on, on on media as well is much improved you know you've got johnny peacock on celebrity come dancing and stuff and, yeah you know you've got addy on bbc one or bbc and um you know steve brown now yeah, a good friend of ours from rugby yeah. is on country file and lots of 
athletes and various people are kind of household names, you know, Anna yeah. Brockroft, Richard Whitehead, you know, to name but a few. There's, there's people whose names are around, um, you know, David Weir and stuff is very well known for London Marathon and things. Yeah, so, of course. Um, so yeah, what I find interesting is that um, there's a lot of people that are, were athletes that become famous, and it's like it'd be interesting to see when there's somebody that's not an athlete that becomes famous with their disability. Like they yeah. become like I feel like that hasn't happened yet. There, like, are, there are a few. I mean, going to the um, the Short Trust Disabled Power List influencer yeah. thing um, was a good example of there's lots of people who are in the media. Um, you know, there's people like is, uh, is it Matt Fraser. I think his name is. Is it? Um, oh, the artist. Yeah, he's yeah. Sort of, uh, does a lot of acting and stuff as well. And um, Sam Renke. I never know how to say name Renke. I think uh, there's lots of people that you know within that list and people who are mm. in the media. But like you say, it probably is dominated mostly by by uh, athletes yeah, who yeah. want to do other stuff. Then yeah, it's, I think a lot of that is driven from 2012 because all those they all seem yeah. to be 2012 athletes mostly yeah. which is quite interesting that there's quite a big thing of, like, it feels like there needs another sort of momentum to push it forward a little yeah. bit more and not necessarily in the sports space but like some other spaces just to yeah. push people because again like, there's not everybody wants to be an athlete and it you yeah. know those people need role models and yeah. that to show them what's possible in other sort of ways and that and that's one of the reasons why I wanted to do like this podcast and things, just to expose some people that are, you know, sort of adapting to their situation and performing in like a different, like yeah. not just one way, but lots of different ways that they do it. And so that's, uh, yeah. again, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to get you on. You know, yeah. you are performing in athlete yeah. area, but I feel like you, what you do with your probably with actor fans is what I'm better known. For yeah, is is. Um, well, I look forward to being exposed. <laughs> <laughs> not that way. <laughs> Yeah, so, um, yeah, talking about, like, the relationships and the families and all that, like, yeah, you've obviously um, just had your second child. Yes. Congratulations on that. So, like, um, I've got, Xanthi uh, is born uh, end of November, so she's now coming up to 10 weeks old, or is 10 weeks old, um, and so I've got Jacob, who's now coming up to six, so... Um, yeah, it's very different having a family. It's a massive game changer, you know. Yeah, it's yeah. a bit more difficult to to go off and be a couple and, and sort of be, you know, travel the world a bit, although we have still managed that a bit with, with the family. Um, but uh, it's great as well. It's really um, great to see how your kids grow up and have influences of yourself and you can see bits of them in you. And, yeah. Um, it's hard work, um, but it's... It's good. It's particularly hard work at the moment with, with a very young baby. Yeah. Like, um, my wife Joe's just tired the whole time. Like she's just only getting tiny amounts of sleep every night, and mm. um, it's also with the type of this, you know, with, with the reduced hand function as well as a mobility problem. Um, it's very hard for me to take over a lot of the stuff, you know, with my hand function. Things like dressing a little baby and doing nappy changes and picking up off the floor and carrying around the house and stuff like that it's very difficult for me yeah um and whereas i do as much as i can you know if i sit on the sofa i can hold her for a while and i can um soothe her and you know sort of lay her on the bed and, and sort of play with her for a bit um it very much does fall onto my wife at the moment Jo. yeah and that's she's doing a brilliant job it's very hard though i can see how difficult it is and it's very hard for me to to help so much there so i i try and look after Jacob as much as I can yeah to take the pressure off looking after him from her as well but I although you say like with the disability effects it like you know men have to get like when a woman has the baby the man still has to work generally sort of yeah. that's how it works and um, it's the same situation for like most people like they're pressured yeah. into doing that stuff so they might not have the time to do it so the wife has to yeah I mean it depends what your roles are in your, yeah exactly your wife, it depends your on the roles yeah in your, your relationship but um yeah, I think it's because we're not bottle feeding, you know, we're breastfeeding, so it's very difficult for me to take over in any yeah. area. Really. It's a bit, you know, I can't really take over on that side at all. No. Uh, and then with the the lack of hand function, it makes it difficult doing a lot of the other sides as well. So, mm. um, like you say, it it does ha have to sort of fall to the to the mum often to do this stuff. Um, 
but uh, it's, it's I would be able to I'd like to be able to help out more particularly at the moment because yeah. I see how hard it is for my wife going through all this stuff and um, and how much it, like the lack of sleep you know is just such hard work really. yeah. so I'd love to be able to help out more on that but um, it is a lovely thing to have you know it, to have a children um, and we're really glad that we, we managed to to do it and um, you know that we've got two now we feel like our family sort of complete and yeah, looking that's, forward that's to them getting older with us. You say like now, um, Jacob's six. As you said. Just just coming up to just, six. Just yeah, coming up to six. Yeah, um, like you could do everything with him. Like, you're not li- limited because he's on his feet and he's walking around. Yeah, you're not really yeah. limited as yeah. to anything that you can can't do with him really. Yeah, and he is very much. He is quite happy with me and my ch- You know, he loves daddy is different to the other daddies, mm. um, and when he was younger like as soon as he was able to sort of sit up and balance he was sitting on my lap and I was pushing him around the house and you know and, and he loves that's kind of, kind of his place of security so whereas you know he'd be happy in, in Joe's arms as well if he's a little bit scared if he can sit on my lap um, it just sort of he sort of leans against me in my chair yeah. and that's his real place of security that's so nice. if he's a bit up, you know scared of something um, he feels quite calm there and relaxed and that's a nice feeling and I can sort of push him around and you know does he do the wheelchair himself uh he does try a bit yeah Yeah. his arms are a bit short at the moment to be able to do Uh, very much he does push around the house in it when I'm not in it yeah but um sometimes when I'm sat in here like my family's over my knee suddenly my niece comes through on my shower chair yeah she just comes in here by herself and like where did you come from yeah (laughs) it's just like she loves getting in it and playing around a bit so and I don't think it's uh faced by it really no um, it's only when adults put their own sort of prejudices on the kids yeah that exactly. they sort of learn that it's a weird thing um, yeah it's good for them to grow up in that sort of environment yeah. and sort of be respectful of somebody that might be a bit yeah and just, they just ask way. questions they don't have any filter do they They're like no. you know when I go and drop Jacob off at his school then all the kids are sort of quite happy to ask questions which maybe their parents feel a bit embarrassed about yeah but you know I am I do look different to the rest of yeah. most of the, the parents there so um, you know it's it's just quite natural that they ask pre- ask questions and I'm quite happy to to answer them yeah um, that's good and I think it's important for them to to see in society that there are people with different body types exactly and, yeah it's um, not just getting on with life in society rather than just being you know closed away in some yeah. place where they'll, they'll put them all together yeah um, so when it came to sort of like having kids and that like was there anything that you needed to do different like differently because you know again, it's the sort of one of those things that you only know if you ask a doctor really about like yeah. the conceiving and like having the baby like was okay. there anything um, that you need to do differently or like what was yeah, that yeah it was we, we yeah. had to um, we had to be a bit more technical about things you know, like <laughs> It's, um, You'd have to go into details. If you don't well, I'll go into some details. It, yeah. it's, uh, so it, you have to. It was a bit different. You sort of separate sex from procreation, essentially. Yeah. So it, it's, uh, you know, it it becomes a little bit less fun when you're trying to actually have a baby because you have to be, you have to make sure you're doing it right. And there's various different ways that people will manage. Um, some people will have to go into hospital and, and have sort of medical intervention. We managed to essentially be quite medical about it, but in a home environment. So um, there's a sort of, for me, I needed to use a sort of special vibe to help me. Uh, and then we sort of... It's just a put, vibrator thing yeah, you yeah. to help you ejaculate. Yeah, yeah. basically. Um, so we, you then just have to be a bit, you have to research what you need to use and how the best way and the cycle of and Joe's cycle and stuff like that. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, the right equipment to use and stuff. But uh, and it took quite a long time. You know, there's quite a big gap between our two children, and um, we wanted there to be a big gap in some way so that I could so that Jacob was a bit more independent before we had our second. Yeah. Um, but it still took sort of about a year to to get pregnant. Um, and yeah, it's quite an in. It, it can be quite hard work sometimes, but yeah. you know some people will find it easy, and it all will depend on 
those involved you know um, was that like quite a stressful time then for the, that or was it sometimes yeah because you've got the sort of cycle of you know getting ready to try and then try it and then you got a couple of two weeks wait and see what happens and then do you make it no which okay we've got another two weeks to wait until we try again and um, all this sort of stuff and it's just a sort of a waiting game not, not knowing what's going to happen um, yeah but uh, you know we've, we've managed it twice so yeah um, congratulations yeah so it, it, it's good it can be done and it, you know we like I said we managed to do it in a bit more of a sort of medical way but at home yeah so it's uh, still between it's still something you did together yeah um, but you know some people may need to go and use hospital stuff or yeah. IVF or whatever you know it depends you know so many people can have a similar injury at the same level or people with different disability types and it can affect you so differently so it just depends yes yeah, I feel like there's if someone says they've had their injury and it's like there's no reason why you can't have, not have a family there's yeah, definitely not. there's always an option like yeah. if it's not natural there's the home way there's yeah. the medical way in the hospital yeah ivf or that you know there's always adoption at the end of the day yeah if well, that, none of those options you know, are that's available what, that's what we got into a you know we thought you know if we don't manage it we'll we'll keep trying for a bit longer and then maybe we'll look to adopt a second one yeah um but yes yeah, it's, it's nice to, to be able to have your own if that's possible yeah of course so yeah, there's there's the stages to go along yeah. so yeah. yeah it's like when I've been talking to doctors in the past and that they said like generally like that's it, uh, there's not many people that have to go down the adoption route so the actual mm. spinal injury doesn't really affect that yeah. it's just more the the act of getting the sperm to the egg rather <laughs> yes, than yeah. the yeah. Yeah. <laughs> rather well than I think a lot of people these days are taking a sample of sperm after quite soon after injury aren't they and then like freezing that yeah um, and I don't think I had that as an option, or I don't remember. Um, I don't think it's an option anymore. Uh, okay, yeah, maybe I've you have to decide sort of, to do that. Yeah, it's okay. like you have to say that we're have it trying for a kid now, uh, and then okay. you can go down those routes. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that that might be an option that you could pay for, as maybe right. Yeah. Like yeah initially, yeah. after injury or something, um, because your 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 sperm does depre does decrease in motility, and yeah, it can a little bit after your injury. Um, but there are ways of, of improving that with your sort of your health and various other yeah. ways. But, um. So yeah, well, like you say, you're an example of how it can happen and how it, yeah. it's important to show these things, you know, to people that have got spinal injury and to people that don't. So like the perception is that, you know, you're not just an asexual being and yeah. yeah. stuck to a wheelchair all the time. You know, you have lives and families and, yeah, yeah. you know, you're happy. and Yeah, yeah, yeah and, you know, when you're... Before you have a family, you have still got, you know, you still want to be a young guy or a young person, whoever you are. You know, you still got um, desires and sexual needs, and you know, yeah, you yeah. want to be a, a, a full person. And um, yeah, it's it's not just about the family as well. You know, this yeah. this whole you know aspect of of being a person, which is not just about your mobility and stuff. Isn't yeah, it? exactly. Yeah, I when I was. Um, because when I uh, had my injury, it was like sort of the dawn of sort of online dating. So I did yeah. a little bit of that and uh, like I got the first question I often get was, can you have sex? Yeah. And I was just like, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, but yeah, it's an important question to people, isn't it? Yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's, it's quite disconcerting it's when it's the first yeah. question that somebody yeah. asks, not, hey, how are you? Yeah, <laughs> it's a less of a filter face to face. You know, you can say what you want online, can't yeah, you? Those exactly. sort of things without offending someone well you when you can't see them their reaction you don't feel that you've offended them so much <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah it's interesting um yeah yeah um so i feel like we should probably talk about like your injury and like, how that came about and that um so obviously it was say 20 years 21 years ago it was yeah. 96 so what was that 22 years ago now ah, so you're a veteran now <laughs> i'm a veteran yeah I had my half life a little while ago, so oh wow! Um, I got yeah. to the point where I've had more of my life post injury than I had before my injury, which is a bit of a weird thing. Yeah, I got another ten years of that before yeah. that point. So yeah, yeah. So you like, so yeah. How old were you when? Yeah. So I was twenty years old. Um, yeah, I was doing a mechanical engineering degree at Warwick Uni, um, and I'd finished my first two years, and uh, every year I went away in the summer holidays with my schoolmates. We went sort of camping down to Devon, um, and we'd done the same that year. It was a big group of like 
don't know, 14, 15 of us. Um, and one night we'd been to the bar on the campsite, um, had a couple of drinks, but not too many. Um, and then we quite often go up into like a headland overlooking the, the sea uh, and just sit around and chat. Um, and we'd been, I'd been doing that with two or three friends. Uh, and there were sort of some benches at the top of this headland and the one bit that overlooked the sea. And then there was a sort of cave system down one side. Um, and I think I was walking towards a tree, which I thought was growing sort of near the edge of the, the sort of cave gully area. Yeah. Um, and I was just mid sentence. So my friends told me that I was halfway through a sentence and then there was just silence. So I was just walking over a little bank towards a, a tree. Uh, and I think the tree was growing from halfway down the, um, the sort of the gully. Um, and so I got to the edge before I got to the tree without realizing because it was dark and, and yeah. um, you couldn't see very well. So I ended up falling um, I must have just taken a step and then there was nothing below it uh, I do remember like a couple of impacts obviously it was pitch black hmm. uh, and then landing on the rocks below which is about a fall of about 40 feet wow um, big drops yeah and I got to the bottom realised pretty quickly I couldn't move anything um, I had another friend who's you know just realised that I'd gone somewhere <laughs> halfway through a sentence tried to go and find me and he also nearly well he sort of fell down but um, as he was falling he managed to sort of throw himself onto his stomach and grab a few things on the way down mm. and he landed very close to me um, luckily not on me but you know he was all got scraped up on his stomach and stuff um, and he then sort of raised the alarm he realised you know I said to him that something wrong don't move me um, I kind of I knew that it wasn't a great <laughs> not yeah. something bad had happened um, so they went and raised the alarm he had to find his way out of this sort of cave um, and go and get the coast guard to come out and it was a it was a big old rescue it was like um, a helicopter and the helicopter couldn't land anywhere because it was so overgrown uh, and they had to end up putting me on a stiff like board that they recover you on mm. uh, and lifting me above their head and walking out to sea with me carried above their head so that the helicopter winch could come down and it was where the, the kind of cave widened hmm. so that they could actually witch me up into the helicopter without banging on the walls on the way up sort of thing. That's crazy. So it was a pretty dramatic rescue. Yeah. And I was in um, Salisbury, Spani in it because that was the closest one to the, the injury in Devon um, for about nine and a half months. Yeah, so like, well, how did that sort of, but like, were you, you say you're aware like of what happened like in the moment and that and like you, were conscious and that so you sort of had an idea of what was going like what was sort of going through your mind were you trying to keep calm or yeah I think I was pretty calm I was obviously worried but I mean I knew something bad had happened but to start with you know sort of with you bang your knee sometimes you can't like move it anything it just hmm. like feels numb and you can't move it for a little while and I thought you know maybe this will come back after a while and then hmm. you know by a few minutes time when I realised I couldn't move um you realise that something much more drastic has happened. Yeah. Uh, and I'd done, I had some knowledge of first aid uh, in that sort of situation. So I was like, well, as soon as my friend arrived, I said, you know, don't move me. Because, you know, you don't know what extra damage you're going to do. Um, and I think uh, I had a steroid injection from the paramedics when they first arrived. Um, and the not moving bit, and I, some people have told me I don't know if it's true or not but you know that might have been what kind of helped me be an incomplete injury that there was less spinal swelling okay um, and that might have been a factor towards me being incomplete rather than a complete injury yeah yeah um, uh, yeah it's worrying when you're down at the bottom of the cliff and it's pitch black and you can smell the sea and you can feel a rock on your head but you can't feel much in the rest of your body <laughs> and you can't move anything so, I mean, your what your injury was a um, diving into sea, wasn't it? Yeah, but so. yeah, because mine wasn't from any height or that. It was just yeah. running in like Baywatch cycle. <laughs> yeah, so but into... I presume you were then in the sea, and unable to. Yeah, move face down sea. in the water. And yeah, I I was a lifeguard, so for me it was like um, I knew about spinal injuries through learning how to uh, if someone has one. Yeah. So um, yeah, I was just like keep calm, 
<laughs> yeah, and, and then, someone came to find you in time, I, obviously. I, yeah, like, I, like, because I was a swimmer, like, the, holding my breath underwater was like, I was just like, oh, my breath for ages. Yeah. <laughs> and then just like, sort of blacked in and out of consciousness. And then next thing I knew, I was on the beach, like, lying with the face in my, like, sun in my eyes. Okay. Surrounded by people. So did they have to resuscitate you? I still, I still don't really know. <laughs> like, okay. Like, so you... I, yeah, it's sort of like, I wasn't with it at all at that point but yeah. I, all I remember saying is like don't move my neck I've got a spinal injury like so oh, yeah, I knew, you knew that much yeah okay. so I was just like don't move it <laughs> yeah um, yeah it's a bit of a weird experience that was mm. yeah like it, it's almost like my body just sort of forgot about everything apart from being a lifeguard yeah like, so just, yeah. just knowing to protect myself and, and I think your body sort of shuts down a bit as well doesn't it like a, I sort of feel like I was slightly in and out of consciousness a bit um, I do remember certain bits of it, but also you're, you know, I was face down in complete pitch blackness for a long time and there's lots of flashing lights when things arrive. But mm. Yeah, time sort of, my memory of that part of it is a little bit sketchy as well. Yeah, I think you, like there's that sort of thing about like your brain purposely forgetting a traumatic experience, mm. like yeah. like details of it so that you, you know, don't relive it almost. Yeah, you know? yeah. Like you learn what you need to learn from it to, make sure it doesn't happen again and <laughs> yeah. then the rest of us I know we don't want to know about that yeah. can raise that in your mind yeah. so yeah um, talk about like the nine you were in the hospital for like nine months after that so what was that sort of experience like for yourself um, I had a lot of support I mean I was um, fairly outgoing at university I had a lot of friends I had my 21st birthday in hospital um, and I was still on bed rest so I had um a couple of coach loads of people come down from my university down to, to um, Salisbury for my birthday and they just basically queued around my bed um, and you know I couldn't do much apart from talk to them all for a little while and they sort of queued up and talked to me for a while and then went off and had a bit of food and came back and um, it was nice it was not my ideal 21st birthday but no. under the circumstances it was lovely to know how many people sort of cared for me and wanted to see me get better and stuff or you yeah, know, move nice. on. Um, but it's a lot of you know hospital is a hard time I did write a, a book about it um, which I tried to get published but it didn't didn't really make it in the end and in some ways I'm sort of slightly glad that it didn't because you're in a frame of mind in hospital which I was, is very different to how I feel now yeah and I think that's quite important for people to to know how much life does change and how much your sort of what you think you know you have, the way that you feel when you're in hospital can change into yeah definitely. To how it is now um and it was yeah it's hard times in hospital it's really difficult and uh uh yeah there's a lot of emotions going on a lot of things to come to terms with and um just the the daily bits of being in a hospital and being away from what you're used to and um coming to terms with a life changing you know thing that's happened yeah so when you because I always talk about when my first injury happened at, like, when it first happened like I didn't I was sort of okay because my purpose was to get back into the swimming straight away yeah um, like did you have something that you wanted to focus on or like that gave you sort of a purpose at the time I suppose going back to university was a big thing um, you know between two years down of a th there's a three year course and I wanted to finish my course and um, all my friends were still back at uni having a great time and I wanted to be back there doing the same so um, that was quite a focus for me um, so um, yeah I did want to to get back to that um, and yeah I had a lot of support from, from other friends and family and stuff and um, uh, like my I'm a Christian so my my church at um, in my hometown were quite sort of responsive as well. They they were good at sending people up to visit me and stuff as well. So you know, it's been there were lots of things that helped me get through um, that time in hospital and help want me to get on with things afterwards as well. Yeah, that's good. Um, yeah, because the reason why I say it is like it feels like when you don't have a purpose, that's when like you start to get depressed and upset. Is like, was there any times like that for yourself or? There were some really difficult times, you know. It was probably the mo most emotional time of my entire life. Um, 
you've got so much to come to terms with. And so, sometimes it was just, you know, I remember the first time that someone said, Do your hands probably won't get much better. And I'd been in hospital, th you know, your knowledge of someone with a spinal injury, the little of it that I had before my injury, yeah. was that people use wheelchairs so their legs don't work. Um, and it's all those other things that come with the spinal injury that you don't understand about um, mm. beforehand. Uh, I just imagined that my, whereas I could, my, my strength in my arms was slowly coming back. There wasn't much change in my fingers. Um, and I was like, you know, when are my fingers are gonna get better? And, mm. you know, it's that time that someone said to me, you know, you'll probably never be able to move your fingers properly. Um, that was a real dark time, you know, yeah. just after being told that. And but there's a lot to deal with in hospitals, isn't there? There's a lot of yeah. emotions to go through and um, stuff to come to terms with. And even things like being, when you start getting up into a wheelchair, someone giving you a bit of a, you know, wheelchairs to sort of try, trial in and see how they get on. And going from one that worked quite well for you to trying another one where you couldn't really do much in it. And the frustration of that, or I had a pressure sore for, um, some time that kept me in bed for quite a while um, and just the frustration of you know I'm here I want to get on with rehabbing I want to get on with getting on with life but I can't even get out of bed yeah um, because of this pressure so all that stuff was really emotionally quite hard work yeah I always find that the hardest thing is like if I have to go to hospital and have to spend any time in bed I feel it's very claustrophobic yeah because you haven't got that movement that you can like, adjust very easily and yeah. it's sort of like I feel stuck yeah, yeah. Yeah, that must. I uh, fingers crossed. I haven't had one. No, I haven't since since been leaving hospital. I haven't had any pressure sores, but um, yeah, I think you got to avoid those as much as possible, haven't you? Yeah, definitely. So um, yeah, like when you came out of hospital, and you say like, you you went straight back to the uni, or were you, was there a gap in between, or? Well, I left hospital in April, um, so I missed that whole year. So I had to wait until after the summer. So I spent a lot of time um, sort of trying to get myself as healthy as I could and as fit as I could. Um, when, before I went back, um, and then I went back in the, the sort of September, October of that same year. Um, and I went back on, on crutches because, again, like we were talking about earlier, I was so determined that walking was the answer sort of thing. Um, and I, I was able to do it, and it felt like it was wrong, not to be able to do the best that you could physically. Like, um, so it felt that it was doing a disservice to other people with spinal injuries in a certain way, if I could do some sort of walking on yeah, crutches yeah. and I wasn't doing it. Um, and there's a, it, it does frustrate me a little bit as well now. Sort of within spinal circles, everyone sort of compares themselves, and you know. Or, you're just a flesh wound or you know it's a, yeah and this is like camaraderie but it's also um probably not the best for people as well no it's you know? sort of one of those things that um it's so unique and so different to each individual person yeah yeah you can't compare yourself like you just might see someone like doing pull-ups and they're doing it and then muscle yeah. up and all that and like, oh, yeah yeah. you've only got a little injury but to that person it's still affecting their life and yeah. what they're doing and like yeah. they're just trying to do the best they can yeah. yeah. So yeah, I went back to uni um, using my car and walking and it was such hard work that Lafana year because everything I did, you know, I had to carry a, a bag with a long strap to, you know, over the shoulder and then walk with sticks and I was just so slow and so I just couldn't do any distance. So I'd have to find all the disabled parking spaces around the campus and I was lucky that the campus was fairly accessible. But, you know, I'd go off to a lecture and I'd have to leave half an hour earlier so that I could park as close as I could and get up on my sticks and walk, you know, 200 metres to a lecture theatre and then do the same afterwards. And people would say, you know, do you want to go for coffee in the students' union? And I'm like, oh, by the time it takes me to get back into the car, yeah. drive over to there, get back out again, they'll have finished the coffee and gone. Mm. So in some ways, I slightly wish I'd gone in back to uni in my chair, I think. If either I'd been a bit more physically able to walk on my sticks, it would have been easier, or a little bit less able that I'd been forced to use my chair, it probably would have been a better option for me. Yeah. Um, I was sort of stuck in that in-between point where I could just about manage on sticks, but it was such hard work. 
Yeah, it seems to be the, the incon incomplete quads, especially, they have this sort of awkward area where you're not quite one and you're not quite the other. Yeah, so, yeah. like, you're not disabled enough to just be in an electric chair, which would make life very easy. Well, not yeah. very, but a lot easier. Yeah. But you're not, like, a para or something that can push your wheelchair yeah. like it's nothing sort of thing. Yeah. You're in this sort of awkward space where you can sort of need a bit of both. Yeah. <laughs> There's not really anything out there for that. So. Yeah, and it, it was it was a hard it took a lot of years for me to kind of get to the point of realization that actually I'm less disabled in my wheelchair most of the time. Yeah. Um, That's quite interesting when you put it like the, the wheelchair, you know, so it enables you to do more. Yeah. Like most yeah. people would think. It's not the, the, not the same in all situations, you know, sometimes um, I do still use my sticks for if I'm doing like a very short distance, but mm. I, I'm not very capable on them anymore. Um, and you know, I try. I did a, a very intensive physio course to see what I could get. Um, and after doing that for for three months, you know, every day, five hours a day, then you sort of realise actually, it's not all about being as the world sees, wants to see people being able of standing up yeah. and moving around on their legs. For me, actually, it, I'm more able to do the things I want to do sitting down and pushing myself around a lot faster and a lot easier. Yeah, it's um, finding what works for you to make yeah. your life better rather than yeah. what, you know, what other people think you should be like. Yeah. yeah. And even now talking about it, I sort of get the that sort of thought of people that I know in my mind who will go, well, no, she's walking, he should be, you know, up on his legs more and he would have got better and stuff. And it's very much, um, it's still something that I struggle with a little bit because I am so much better at getting on with life not walking yeah it's a difficult uh, balance to get like oh you can do this but I need to do this yeah yeah it's, it is a difficult balance like um, like people within spinal injuries they sort of like know about it and yeah. like their opinion is different to someone that yeah. doesn't know about it and it's yeah. like all these people thinking about what you should be yeah yeah, you've got to you've got to get what's right for you. And, uh, exactly. Yeah, you got. Uh, it's your life at the end of the day. You've got to yeah. find out what's works for you, and what makes you, and, mm. and just get on with it. And I think I had too many years where I, I made things more difficult for myself, or I missed out on opportunities and and things that I could have done because of trying to be upright as the world sees it. Um, than if I'd have just got on with it and used my chair earlier. Yeah, so, yeah. Like particularly that first year back at uni, it would have been much better doing it in the chair. And you finished uni and all that. Yeah. yeah so I finished my degree, um, got a mechanical engineering degree, um, and then ended up liking staying in the area that I was at, um, and that's when I sort of started doing the events things. Nice. So it's quite a good transition to go through, like these different stages and yeah. that of your yeah. life. Yeah. Um, and do mechanical engineering, I suppose that helps for now with active hands. Does yeah, it, like, I mean, it's got active hands are like I said, they're simple, they're not very technical products, but just having a background of materials and forces and way things work yeah. and other options. And, and as we sort of develop new products, um, you know, I've had to develop a manufacture of you know the hooks themselves and um, the plastic parts and doing 3D printing of things to you know more complex things like the, the small items aid. Um, so it has helped in that area. Yeah, that's good. That, yeah, because yeah, I, I know a lot of people who come out of university they don't really use it too much. So to have yeah. it, you know, having that link and something it, you're interested in. It's, yeah, it's not used overly, but it's it, you it's know, still it's there. background. Yeah, there. and I, I've always enjoyed making stuff. You know, that's yeah. why I got into mechanical engineering. I I always liked the kind of making stuff side of it and the low tech side of it, rather than all the complex mathematics and um, calculations and stuff that some of the engineering people ended up doing. It didn't really interest me. Mm. Where do you think that you would have ended up if it wasn't the uh, having a spinal injury? Do you think like? I think I'd have probably ended up going back to. I'd probably end up getting my degree, going back to um, my childhood where I was brought up in Reading, um, and settling down in a normal engineering job um, in that area, and that wouldn't have been necessarily that bad at all. No. Um, I'm glad. Of the things that have happened to me and a lot of the opportunities I've had are potentially through, you know because of my injury um, so it'll be interesting to d 
do the sliding doors thing and be able to go back and see what I was doing yeah. right now if my injury hadn't have happened. But I don't think I'd necessarily swap it if, you know, it, I, I'm quite happy with life as it is at the moment. I think life's Yeah, good that's I, that's interesting thing again, like I talk to people and they say, like, I wouldn't necessarily change my situation because mm. I'm happy where I am. Like, yeah. yeah, I don't know what's on that other, the other side of that sliding yeah. door. So, yeah. you know, it could be worse off and it's, I think it's quite an interesting, like, well, an important thing to, like, just, like, just because your life is different doesn't mean it's worse. Like, mm. it, you know, it's just different. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it was a really good opportunity for me because the the sort of system most people follow into is that, you know, you do your, your education and then, you know, if you're academically minded, you might go on and do A-levels and then do a degree and then you do more study or you go and get a job or whatever. It becomes a sort of, like conveyor belt of one thing to the next thing um, and I really think the thing about having a big drastic thing happen in your life like a spinal injury is that you get to take a step back from that conveyor belt essentially yeah. uh, and think actually what do I what do I want in from life what do I enjoy in life what do I want to do in the future um, and it's like a real you know you withdraw yourself from the rest of the community for a while and in that conveyor belt, and then you go, okay, what what do I want to? What's important? Yeah, um, it makes you appreciate things a little bit more yeah, as well. Yeah. yeah, and I, you know, I did a, I've done loads of traveling. I, I backpacked around the world a number of times, you know, um, with friends and things after my injury, uh, and that is the sort of thing I probably wouldn't have ended up doing had I just gone straight into a, a, a job, you know, and had a family and got settled down somewhere. Um, in just that sort of thing of being able to say okay I'm going to do some travelling I'm going to do some disability sport I'm going to set up my own company you know all these things that you have a chance to sort of step a bit back from to get the headspace to think okay this is what I, this is what I fancy doing and let's have a go at doing that so what was the disability tra- like travelling with a disability backpacking that's not something you normally hear from someone like I'm a quadriplegic let's go backpacking <laughs> yeah. yeah well uh yeah, it was elements of hard, but it was probably one of the best times of my life. You know, you, it was about three years after I finished my degree, um, and me and my best mate, uh, we decided to get some money together and we went travelling around the world for nine months. So we did. We started off in sort of Southeast Asia and travelled around that area for quite a bit, and then went to Australia, New Zealand, Pacific Islands, and then we met another friend uh, in Van in Vancouver bought a camper van and then drove around the whole of North America for three months in nice. a camper van together and then That's sold cool. it in Toronto um, but yeah it's, it's elements of travelling in a wheelchair is, is difficult can imagine um, I was like I was saying I was fortunate I can do a few steps on my crutches and that made a massive difference when you're trying to you know get on and off a, a boat in Thailand to go out to one of some of the islands or stuff yeah. like that That's that makes a big difference but particularly in Southeast Asia, people are just so willing to help. And, you know, when you're with backpackers, they're all willing to help, the locals are willing to help. And even if you have to sort of pay for assistance in certain areas, it's not particularly expensive. Yeah, um, it's because it's I feel like we're very privileged in this country with, a lot, so a lot of people complain about accessibility, but then when yeah, you go yeah. abroad, like even to like other countries that are, you know, like Western civilization and stuff, yeah we're very lucky here with what we've got. Yeah, I mean, you were, when you're in a country that has flash floods, you know, like in Thailand, that just chucks it down at certain times of the day in the rainy season, and so the curbs don't, or over, or the rivers don't overflow, they have like huge curbs, and then the drains fill up the roads quite often, yeah. so you, you know, you've got like a, you know, 10 inch curb to try and get up with no drop curbs and stuff like that, yeah. so um, it, it's hard work, but, and, you know, a lot of the paths that you try and push on aren't, the same as we'd expect here. Yeah, it's only but, stuck and there's only a tree. Yeah, <laughs> so. but on the same side, because of that, the the drivers are used to basically seeing people, you know, pushing carts to try and sell their wares in the road. Mm. You know, there's pedestrians in the road, there's dogs and stuff, and um, people are used to that as well. So whereas you you might not be pushing down a path, you know, in in a town you'd be pushing down a road but people are looking out for you as well and yeah um, you just have to make do really it's hard sometimes trying to find places to stay that are accessible yeah and, 
Like, um, that's what we find with the accessibility stuff. Like, I know yeah. what I need, yeah. but they might not have, have a disability room, but it might be suitable. Yeah. Because I know what I need. Like, I know yeah. exactly what I need the bathroom to be like and yeah. all that stuff. It's, yeah. So, when we've been aware, it's like, can you just send me pictures? Just yeah. go in the room, take a picture and email it to me so I can tell you if it's okay or not. Yeah. Yeah, that's not, it's probably a little bit more doable now, even in sort of Southeast Asia. But, um, mm. you know, when I first traveled, it was, you know, you, you turn up on, a tuk tuk, and you have to sort of find some accommodation, and then I'd send my mate in just just to literally have a look at it. Yeah, you know, see if are we going to be able to manage this, or we're not going to be able to manage this, and then you'd have to go to another place if you couldn't manage it. But um, after a while, you get you know fairly efficient at, at doing that. And, yeah, um, accommodation is is fairly cheap. So if you need to spend a bit more one night because you can't stay in the place that costs you. You know, one pound fifty a night, then you can stay somewhere it costs you two pound fifty a night <laughs> uh, if it's a bit more accessible. Yeah. So yeah, uh, like, do you feel like there's um, with the travelling and that? Is there anything that um, you'd like recommend for people to if they wanted to do something similar, like I'd just say, sort of go for it and find out what happens? Or yeah, I mean, I was very green when we first started. My, I, I went away post injury the first time with uh, a group of wheelchair rugby lads who went on a. Um, a little trip down to Florida to play in a rugby tournament and that was my first time you know flying and traveling post injury um, and I thought yeah I can I can give this a go and I've always you know I didn't really do anything travel wise before going away for nine months you know nine months backpacking is you know it's a big trip you know um, and we I couldn't really carry a rucksack very well so I had a day bag and then my mate carried a massive rucksack between the two of us, which had all of our clothes between the two of us, and um, and I had to like send medical equipment out to a couple of places, you know, around the on the trip to just make sure I had enough to keep going. Yeah. Um, and you have to sort of, you just have to compromise a bit. So you know, with your medical stuff, you might have to use stuff. You know, you you don't take as many clothes as you want. And you have to wash them more regularly, and yeah. all these things. You just have to um, work out ways that you can economize um without it affecting your you know your health and stuff or whatever you know the ability to carry the amount of stuff you need but um you get used to it after you know the the, the first couple of weeks we were experimenting and finding new ways to do things and just after a while you you work out what works for you yeah um and i've yeah like i said it was one of the best times of my life really that's cool yeah it's like it's quite interesting because I don't, like you're the only person I know that's done that sort of thing in mm. the situation. So it's quite a unique perspective to get on it all, really. Yeah, yeah, it's I I do love the the cheaper side of backpacking. You know, that doing it in rather than hotels, doing it in hostels and stuff. The way mm. that you stay is um, it's a really nice way to do it, and it give it does give you loads of confidence because you know that once you can do that, if you've been in some situations that are a bit difficult, then you work out ways to, to do things. And I've traveled on my own now. I've traveled on my own in Thailand, Dubai, Japan, you know, a few, Bangladesh. I went to work as a volunteer in Bangladesh for a while. Uh, and this is all traveling on my own. Um, and it gives you that confidence that you know that people will always help you out yeah. if you get really stuck. Um, and that you will, you know, there will be some difficult situations, but you generally can find a way to to overcome them yeah it's all about putting yourself in those situations that really challenges you and yeah. find out what you can and can't do yeah and that's I feel like that's a better life experience than going you know you did your physio and that you probably mm. learnt more from a week doing yeah by yourself in Thailand than you ever did like yeah. doing a physio or that or. yeah and there's something just confidence boosting about feeling confident enough to travel on your own or to travel with you yeah. know, a friend and yeah and learning um, how to like communicate with people yeah and, you know yeah. yeah, even when you've got no communication, you you can always kind of work out how to be understood most of the time. We had one situation Lots when... Lots of pointing. Was, was <laughs> Lots of pointing. Yeah. Things. There's one bit in Indonesia when I actually even managed to lose my wheelchair. So we'd gone down to this um, this waterfall. Me and my mate, we, we ended up buying, a, no, hiring a little car in, in, in Bali. And we drove down to, the, to this waterfall um, and we wanted to go for a swim in the waterfall so um, we were just, just the two of us on our own um, and we ended up going down like this sort of 
dirt path down the hill to get from the place we parked the car down to the waterfall. Um, and then on the way back up, um, it was getting dark as well. And uh, we were going back up this hill and it was so steep that you couldn't, my mate couldn't even push me really. So he had to go back to the car, get me sticks. And I had to sort of just take really, really slow steps, um, you know, just to try and get back up this dirt path. And it was really hard work. And at one point he came to sort of help me behind and then my wheelchair was just left on the side and it just went and fell and it just like tumbled off the edge of this sort of dirt track down through this undergrowth down and down downhill and we just couldn't see it we must have you know it's well out of sight um and we were just like well it's getting dark you know we have to get back to the car somehow i don't know how we're going to get this and we had to go back to our accommodation uh, and i had to make it up to the car in the sticks um and then come back the next day and try and work out how we were going to recover this random wheelchair. We worked out the, we found out the Indonesian word for wheelchair, and then we went around and sort of talked to all the locals and some random locals had found it from a village at the bottom of this hill without a person in it. I was like, how on earth has this got here? Um, and we, had, we had ended up having to pay them like a little bit of a finder's fee essentially to get it back, but it was it was well worth it. But I had a whole night where I was just. You know, I was like, what am I going to do? I've got no wheelchair. How, how am I going to do the rest of these travels? <laughs> you know, I might be able to do a little short distance on sticks, but I can't carry that on for the, you know, for the future. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was uh, getting some interesting scrapes like that. and uh, But just finding your way out of them is, is uh, kind of character building and stuff. Yeah, well. definitely. Like, yeah. That's when you find out who you really are. Yeah, and you, how, how resourceful you can be. Like, you know, when you something breaks on your chair I think I had a, a caster fall off at one point and then you sort of find bike shops and mechanics places and people will always be able to find a you know a way to fix something or you know you, if you look a bit outside the box there's always ways to to get around problems yeah that's, that's quite cool I bet there's uh, lots of experiences that you've learned there that yeah that's quite interesting yeah and I think it, yeah once you start doing that sort of stuff it, it, it's great for knowing that you can overcome those situations yeah that's good so um the other thing i wanted to talk to you about was like what you've done sort of in your athlete side of it as well because so in the beginning you've done lots of different things and it's fascinating like just how much you've done mm. and that and you obviously do did your wheelchair rugby and now a bit of wheelchair racing as well sort of yeah how did that all come about and well i, I actually found out about the rugby um when I, was, I went to the Spano Unit Games. Um, so the, I ended up playing um, some quad rugby there and they were like, oh, you know, you should come and train with us when, you, you know, when you're at a hospital. And I was really keen on that. I wanted to, I think when I was in hospital, what was it, 96, yeah. So I think there was um, some sort of championships on it. It might have been the Paralympics or something else, disability sport, which was on TV and I was watching the wheelchair rugby, wheelchair basketball. Uh, and I was like, yeah, you know, if, if I'm going to be, have a disability for the rest of my life, then I should, you know, find out what sports are out there. So it was interesting to go to the Spina Games um, and see the rugby. Uh, and I started playing that within about six months of leaving hospital. Um, and that was, that was really good to do. Did you have uh, much interest in sports before? Was yeah, it? I used to play, I used to be in the gym most days. Um, uh, doing weights and stuff and doing I used to play a lot of table tennis and a lot of rock climbing um, and swimming and whatever I used to be very much into um, activities um, and yeah I wanted to find what would what would be accessible for me afterwards so the rugby was the first thing I felt I, I came to turn you know started playing um, and absolutely loved it and played that for about 10 years um, and really enjoyed it it was lovely playing team sport it was lovely being in, in there with people who are similar disabilities to me and that also helped me learn loads of stuff like I said when the first time I travelled was with the rugby guys going to a tournament in America um, and just seeing how other people cope with their injury you know years on from it yeah um, was really good uh, and then I think I towards the I was playing for about eight years or so and I thought well actually I want to tick some more things off my bucket list so I'd like to be able to 
complete a marathon. So I don't really want to do it in my rugby chair. So let's see if I can borrow one of these racing chairs, which I'd seen on TV, mm. um, and see if I can have a go at that. I always used to be a fairly an okay long distance runner before my injury. So I kind of like the idea of trying to complete a marathon. So I borrowed a chair um, and I trained up over about a year and then managed to complete London Marathon. I think my first London Marathon was three hours and six um, in, a, in a race chair. Um, How long ago was that when you did your first? Well, I think I've done about 13 London Marathons wow. now. Um, so yeah, that many. I think I missed one or two years, so maybe 14, 15 years ago. Um, so yeah, a long time ago now. Uh, and it just, I just liked the fact that it was very much an individual sport. Like I love the team sport element of it mm -hmm. and the social side of it. But sometimes you'd be sitting on the sideline and your team was not playing very well or, and you just sort of think, yeah, I just want, I want it to be, I want my success or failure down to me. Yeah. You know, and the training I've done and the preparation I've done. Uh, so coming from a swimming background, I can totally understand. Yeah. <laughs> understand that the individuality of it, like, yeah. 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 You want to see you. Sometimes you see people playing on court and you think, oh, they're, they're not, they're, you know, it's great playing with a team, but if a few people are underperforming or if you are underperforming and letting your team down, mm. um, it's a bit frustrating and it's just sort of, it's nice to be able to be just, you know, your, your success or failure is all d down to you. Yeah, yes. Um, and I quite like the, the technical side of the wheelchair racing as well. It's quite a technical sport and the, the chair set up and the type of pushing and the gloves that you make to help you push and stuff. So um, that all appealed to me. Um, so yeah, I just got started training and uh, I've really got into the racing ever since and I don't, I don't really get to play rugby anymore, unfortunately. I have mm. all my time spent um, training for, for wheelchair racing. So I saw when uh, through social media last year you won your category, is that right? Is that the first time that? Really so this did? is in London Marathon, London yeah. Marathon, yeah. So um, last year there was a T52 category, um, or T51, T52. So yeah, I, I managed to win that, so I got the gold in that, which is which is really good. I managed to get a bronze a few years ago um, and a gold uh, last year. So that was a really good achievement. Yeah, that was fantastic. probably one of my best races. And just the way the race went as well, um, it kind of went according to my plan and how I thought it would go. Yeah. You know, I dropped off the, the guy who was in the lead in my category about the sort of 13, 14 mile mark when it gets the ground gets a bit rough and it gets a bit more hilly. Um, and I dropped off the back there and I, I could just keep him in sight um, but he was like a minute ahead or something. Uh, and then towards the end, you know, I, it was my thought, you know, I'll be strong towards the end. And I could see him with about 23 miles to get uh, into the race. I was like, okay, right, I can catch him. But I know that he's got quite a good sprint finish. So I need to catch him and pass him and just keep my head going down and don't let him get on the back of me. Mm. Because then if it comes to a sprint finish at the end, he might well get me. So I was just really pleased at how my sort of game plan went according to how it does which is it doesn't normally so, <laughs> so it was nice that uh, I got a win out of that one that was a, that was a great race yeah it's a fantastic achievement especially after doing it for so many years and yeah, then, yeah you know that's really cool right, um where do you see like do you see yourself going forwards with that like with the um well I've always been a distance racer so um it's a bit frustrating uh that there's not any marathon distance for me in a Paralympic event so um, the, for my category is a 100, a 400 and a 1500. Yeah. So I'm, I've been competitive at a 1500 before. I've got a silver medal in the European Championships, but on a world stage, um, I don't, I'm still struggling to get a selection for a GB team, um, you know, on a sort of Paralympic or world event. So we'll have to see, you know, I, I, I will just probably do the longer stuff because that's what I'm good at and that's what yeah. I enjoy and it's just a frustration that there's no possibility for me to compete yeah. in that event at a Paralympic level. Yeah, that, that must be frustrating. Luckily, there are things like the London Marathon you can do yeah. to, yeah. I know that's still fairly, you know, quite a prestigious event. And that's yeah, like, unfortunately, though, I've just heard last week, which has really annoyed me, that they've not got a, a World Champs Marathon this year, where, which is normally uh, what they have at London. Um, they've kind of grouped our category and with the two categories above. Um, so to even get the qualifying time, you have to do a time five minutes faster than the world record time for my 
um, wow. category. So yeah, no, I, I yeah, I've experienced similar stuff with swimming in the past. Yeah, it's it's really frustrating, and it's that kind of catch twenty two thing of you know if you don't put events in, you won't get people of that category doing those events to get qualifying times, mm. and if you don't have people doing qualifying times, there's no reason to put an event in. Yeah. So it's it's a, it's a frustration, but um, you know I'm a long distance racer and much as I can try and do stuff on the track and I will do stuff on the track it's just not what I'm as good at yeah that's fair enough so um, I'll still try and compete I'll probably go out to Switzerland in May uh, there's a big sort of international event that goes out there that's um, where all the racers from the world go and try and get their good time so I'll, I'm planning to go to that uh, and then see what happens going forward for Tokyo and, and world champs and stuff like that so I'll always try my best but yeah um with a lack of event for me, it's a bit difficult. Don't know how you fit all this in, you know, with your family and your business and your racing. It's yeah, <laughs> it's, I don't get much social life these days, to be honest. <laughs> um, so yeah, between, you know, I train every day, uh, well, I train normally six days a week, I have one day off a week, um, sort of eight to 10 sessions a week, uh, and then the business and then the family stuff, and there's not really much time for anything else. Yeah. But um, it, it's a, it's a t- it's a decision that I've made myself, so I'm happy with that. It's not been like forced on me, so I'm yeah. happy to sort of decide. Okay, this is this is what my life's going to be like for this period of it, and then yeah. you know maybe down the line when the family's a bit older, things will be different, and maybe I can focus more on the business or on the training or whatever it is really. Yeah. So you said about the future. Is that what's you? Is there anything like you want to go at, like do you, with the business or with your racing? Like what do you sort of see yourself going? towards um i see myself always doing some sort of physical activity whether that's competitive or not um i think it's good for for everybody but particularly for people with a disability to keep active because you know you can go downhill quite quickly if you're not active um and it's not good for your health and i also just enjoy it mental health wise it's good for that so i think i would always try and do some sort of physical activity um, whether it's to a competitive level or not, I'll try and maintain it. Um, Business-wise, we we trying to get more. You know, we're bringing out new products all the time, so I'm quite involved in developing the new products. And as time goes on, we're sort of coming into new markets. Um, in whether that's new areas of the world to sell our products to, uh, or new types of disabilities that we are catering for. So. We're going to keep it to specifically hand function disability stuff, um, but there is a lot of, you know, the more you get into that, the more you realise that there are more people affected by that than you think in different yeah. disability types. So it's getting um, the word out there so people understand that there is stuff out there for yeah, them. Yeah, yeah, we're always looking for new products to to sell of our own and of other people's that, that, that work well in that area. But yeah, we're sort of developing a bit in the in the limb difference area, which you know, people who are through either through amputation or for are born with parts of their hands or fingers missing. Um, we're trying to develop a few more products for those people at the moment. Um, and I see that as a, an area of growth in the future, maybe. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, there's just as many amputees out there as there are spinal injury people. Yeah. So yeah, there's quite a lot of, you say there's growth in that area for yourselves. Yeah. And it's very interesting learning about that different type of disability because everyone, um, the, the the differences that you have in people's hands only that are affected is absolutely vast yeah so the, when you've got someone with a spinal injury they've generally got an able-bodied person's hand that doesn't work but the dimensions of it and the way it works is all the same mostly yeah. but when you come to someone with limb difference it can be completely random you know you've, you might have a wrist or no wrist or a palm fingers missing fingers that don't bend you know fingers that are like sort of two big claw like fingers rather than it's all completely different and it's yeah it's very hard to design without making everyone bespoke yeah but um it's uh, it's really an interesting area to learn about and to try and make our products work for so I'm yeah that. that's that's cool i bet it's an interesting challenge to uh, overcome yeah especially coming from that, that engineering background yeah that, no, I'm, I'm that's the fun side of it <laughs> yeah that's good yeah um so yeah, I think that's I think we're pretty good with all that. Is there anything else you'd like to talk about? Like, um, no, I think we've covered most areas. Yeah, so happy with that. there's a lot to talk about with yourself. Bored. 
<laughs> no, <laughs> it's like wittering on for hours. No, no it's, yeah, I, I think that really great stuff there. Like, there's lots of information that some people can take away and mm. sort of learn from and that. Um, if people want to know more about what you're doing, what stuff, where do you want them to go and have a look? I mean, our website is the best place, www.activehands.com. Um, and we are very active on social media as well. You can just sort of search Active Hands and um, or Active Hands Gripping Aids will certainly come to us. Yeah, but, um, yeah. We we've we post quite a lot on Facebook and other social media. So um, it's not just about our own products. We sort of try and post stuff about disability related things in general. Yeah, and obviously they can uh, see all the, your products in work at, when I'm with, with my videos and that. Yeah, so yeah. and mm-hmm. there's other things out there, not just the fitness side. There's other things. Yeah. Like, you know, yeah, we're cooking or make up. products. Yeah, so just have a look on our website and. Yeah, it's really amazing stuff. the work you do. So um, I think, it's, as you say, it's making a real difference in the world. And yeah, I hope so. Yeah, it's really good. Um, well, I would love to have you back at some point. Anyway, I think it would be cool to have you and your wife. Yeah, that'd on be the nice. show, you know, yeah. talking about what it's like. Yeah. You know, getting a bit more in depth with the relationship side of it, and that I think okay. that'd be really interesting. So, but anyway, thank you very much. Oh, that's been oh, that's been great. I've absolutely loved much. it. Cheers, man. Cheers. Take care. No worries. Yeah.